Hi. Good morning. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you to all the Creative Mornings team and volunteers and everybody at CAM, especially Gab and Eric. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I've been to some of these events in the past, but I've never actually given one, so this is a big deal, and I am excited to be here. And as Jonathan said, I am Jennifer Dassel. I am the Associate Curator of Contemporary Art at the North Carolina Museum of Art, and I'm also the host and creator of the Art Curious podcast, which I will talk to you a little bit about today. And and I am excited to be here to talk to you about genius. Not me, I wanna make this very clear. It's not, I am not the genius here. Um, in particular, I wanna talk about the way that we talk about artists and what kind of terms we say when we're talking about them as being artistic geniuses. But before I do that, I wanna talk a little bit about how I got here because I think if you had asked me 20 years ago that I would be spending my vocation as a curator at the North Carolina Museum of Art and also as my avocation um, as a podcaster about art, I think I would have told you that that would have been completely crazy. That was not at all in my plan. And that's because I grew up thinking that art was totally boring. Um, this is a piece I love by an artist named Stephen Dobbin, and it really encapsulates how I used to think about art. When I was growing up, it was not something that I engaged in at all. It certainly wasn't a core curriculum in my schools. Um, I remember specifically going to one museum with my parents. It was to see a Claude Monet exhibition, and I was bored out of my mind because to me, it just looked like a bunch of scribbles, and I thought that that work of art had nothing to reflect about my experience or the experience of any of my family, of friends, people I knew. Didn't mean anything to me. So that was probably best case scenario. Best case scenario, I thought art was boring. Worst case scenario <laughs> is that when I was in middle school, we did finally have an art teacher who came in about once a month. And she was the epitome of the type of person you see on the screen, this stern teacher who really brought no joy to this concept of art or the creation of art. And what I remember most is that she began every single class with the same exercise. And that is that she would tell us, you have five minutes. She'd put on egg timer. And she would say, you have five minutes to freehand draw me a perfect circle. So no tools, no, definitely no compass, no nothing. You could erase as much as you wanted. You could scribble, whatever. But in five minutes, you had to have a perfect circle on a piece of paper. And then, it's like insult to injury, you had to turn in that piece of paper and you would get a letter grade on it. <sighs> so if you are anything like me and you're a perfectionist and you're always looking for the straight A, type A's, anybody? Yay, I see you, I feel you. Um, that was terrible. And I remember the day that I got a C plus and that was the best because most of the time I completely failed. I flunked art because that was what art was to this particular teacher. And on the, uh, the consideration of my husband, he told me that I should try this <laughs> 25 years later. And I have to tell you, I set a timer on my phone and it was the most frustrating five minutes. <laughs> Seriously, if you want to just give yourself pain, try this thing. Um, this is what I ended up drawing. And uh, that's saying a lot because I have a toddler at home. So feeling more frustrated by art, that's a big deal. So fast forward about a decade later. I'm finally ready to go to college. I'm very excited and I am a science major. I'm majoring in geology and I get all of my first freshman courses lined up. I've got chemistry labs, calculus courses, and I'm ready to go, except I need one more thing. I need one elective, like a humanities elective to get some of those requirements out of the way for my bachelor's degree. And I registered or attempted to register for about five or six different courses, and they were all at capacity. They were all totally closed. I couldn't get in. And I found myself at a loss because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to get. I knew I needed one more class. So I met with a course counselor who said, you know what, it's gonna be fine. We're just gonna open the course catalog, which was like, for many of you who might not know, it was a book that was like this thick that showed you every single class that would be offered for that year. And the lady opened to the first part, to the letter A, and she stopped there too. And she saw art history and said, oh, everyone takes these classes. These are super popular, they're big. It's just like ancient art to Renaissance, Art History 101, let's just see if we can get you in. And two minutes later, I found myself registered for my very first art history class. How did I feel about it? <sighs> 
not good. I was not happy. It was probably the most surprising that I could have ever felt because this was the last course that I would have ever chosen for myself. And instead, it was really just chosen randomly for me. But the thing that was even more surprising wasn't that. It was the fact that about three weeks later, I found myself sitting by the pool at my dorm because I went to school in Southern California. So, of course, there was a pool at the dorm. And all of my friends were around reading paperbacks and trashy romance novels. And what did I have? I had my giant art history textbook, and I was reading it for fun. <laughs> no joke. I literally was so engaged in the stories about art history that I was learning in this course that I was reading ahead for fun on my spare time. These stories about art, about why a certain artist would choose to create something in marble as opposed to terracotta, what inspired a cave person for the very first time to make a mark of their hand up on a wall, why an artist would be really drawn to using the color blue so much. All of these stories, for the very first time, appealed to me. And I had no idea that it would open this incredible world where it was all about tales that I knew nothing about, and I could not stop wanting to know more. So the thing about when you finally decide to major in something like art history is that very quickly you realize that people will fall into two different camps when you talk about what you're doing. The first is that you immediately meet your tribe, the people who are the same people who will look at really cheesy art jokes and art memes and laugh with you and support you and say that they love art and they love museums, they love exhibitions, and they get it. They get why you would want to study something like art history. Probably a little more common is these groups of people. <laughs> Please tell me your job prospects. Um, I can say, by the way, you can get there. You can get to the other side as someone who works in art. Um, it is possible. But I always felt that there was also this subsect of people who would also be the same type of people who were just like me a couple of years before and really would say to me, oh, I'm only at the museum because my parents made me come or my grandma brought me here today. I'm not here of my own accord. And that really stuck with me because I didn't have this self-understanding at the time to remember that I was that person just only a couple of years prior. And instead, I felt very affronted. Like, how could you, how dare you think that something I love so much is so boring? And it really just stuck with me. And even now, as I went through my bachelor's degree and through graduate school, and even now as a curator at the North Carolina Museum of Art, I still find that people generally fall into these two camps um, in various degrees. First are the people that are still art people, museum people, who are always coming to things like that. And then there's a second amount of people who are like, no, bye, not into this. That's not my thing. And that is one of the main reasons that I started the Art Curious podcast. And in the podcast, I, uh, the tagline is that I explore the unexpected, the slightly odd, and the strangely wonderful in art history. And that's because for me, it all started with a story. If you can tell someone a really good story and get them interested in something that they might normally not think about or think that they're not going to be interested in, that could change everything. And it certainly changed my life. So we just celebrated our first anniversary of the podcast earlier this month, which is exciting. And uh, in the first year of the podcast, we covered all kinds of very different, um, very interesting kind of crazy things, like whether or not a British painter called Walk Walter Sickert could have possibly been Jack the Ripper. Um, if the CIA actually funneled money towards abstract expressionist artists in order to fight the Cold War, spoiler alert, they really did. What happens when you combine art history with medical, modern medicine, and actually go to diagnose particular paintings and people in works of art? And also, what would drive someone to um, want to attack and physically harm a work of art as opposed to a person? So in all of that, there seems to be one topic that I have touched on again and again in various forms in the podcast, and something that seems to come up often when you are talking about creative people, especially famous artists. Any guesses what that topic might be? Ooh, someone got very close here. Actually, a couple people got very close. But it's actually the theme of the talk today. It's genius. It's almost impossible for you not to hear somebody talk about so-and-so being an artistic genius. It's something that everybody talks about 
all the time. And you can get a list of names of famous artists who are geniuses for any variety of reasons. So like Michelangelo was a genius because of the way that he brought back this imperfect, amazing human form to sculpture and painting. And uh, Picasso was a genius because of the way he broke down that form into per pure abstraction. Rembrandt was a genius because of his use of shadow and darkness, whereas Claude Monet was a genius because he did the total opposite. It was light and color and brightness that he brought. And then there's the person that I think is probably the number one actual legitimate genius, like the epitome of the Renaissance man, and that's Leonardo da Vinci, who not only was an incredible artist, but he also had his hand in everything, architecture, math, biology, paleobiology, um, botany, and was an engineer and an inventor on top of all of that. And those are only like a selection of the things he was really into. He was into a lot of other stuff too. And he also was one of the persons that came up with the first ideas for human-powered flight, armored cars. So a lot of the technology you see today, things that Leonardo da Vinci came up with hundreds of years ago, just pretty incredible. But that being said, there seems to be one name that comes up time and time again, not just in daily conversation, but also a name that comes up for various art um, aficionados and officials when they're talking about the phrase artistic genius. So say you go to Google right now and you type in artistic genius and you narrow down that phrase specifically to show results only for visual artists so that you won't see a whole bunch of memes about Kanye, which is what I had to do, seriously. A lot of Kanye memes. <laughs> and you're going to see one person because he, and it almost always is a dead white male, in case you were curious, he seems to be the epitome of this idea of a particular type of creative genius. OK, class, any guesses who that person might be? Yes. Oh my gosh, first thing I heard, Van Gogh. That's right, Vincent Van Gogh. So I think for many of us, we can automatically say that Van Gogh is this certified artistic genius. And I know that one look at Starry Night has been known to send people into these amazing exaltations and raptures. Um, and it's really amazing. But the question is, why have I decided to be here to talk to you today about Vincent Van Gogh when I could really be talking about any of the artists I just showed you or any number of artists who aren't dead white men? And that is because I think Vincent Van Gogh is a very special case that clearly illustrates how many of us choose to talk about visual artists. And somebody here was talking about some of those terms that we use when I talked about whether or not it was genius. Somebody said sadness. Somebody said mental illness. And I think that's certainly something that's the case of Vincent Van Gogh because we don't just call him a genius most of the time. We call him uh, a genius with a piggybacked modifier. There's always an adjective that seems to accompany it. And it's suffering, mad, tortured. And so predominant is that idea of Van Gogh as a tortured genius that when you actually look up the trope or archetype of tortured genius on Wikipedia, you see this portrait of Van, Van Gogh with the bandaged ear. It's the same one that I just showed you on the screen. Like literally, it's the only picture for tortured artist, tortured genius. So. The story of Van Gogh is one that I actually told really early on in the Art Curious podcast. It was my second episode. And that show specifically dealt with a question about Van Gogh's death. Most of us know that he most likely, it has not been totally confirmed, but most likely committed suicide. But a few years back, there was a book that was written where a couple authors said that they think it could have possibly been murder. So if you are interested in a really crazy, really fascinating story about this topic that includes all kinds of weird twists and turns, um, including my favorite part, which is how somebody with a cowboy fetish might have been involved in Van Gogh's death, check it out. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> but the thing about that is that I actually began talking in that episode about how it's really hard for us to separate Van Gogh as a person from Van Gogh as an idea. And that's because this concept of Van Gogh, the idea of him and his life, has really been surrounding us for decades. And I think it really started hitting this height at the mid of the 20th century. So in the 1930s, there was this blockbuster novel that came out by a man named Irving Stone. It was called Lust for Life. And about 20 years later, it was made into an Academy Award winning film with Kirk Douglas in the role of Vincent Van Gogh. And then it just hit this height where everyone was surrounded in movies and books by this idea of Van Gogh as this torp, uh, 
poor tortured soul. And then it reached this higher schmaltzy phase in the late 60s when the songwriter Don McLean, who wrote American Pie, released a song called Vincent. And if you are as old as I am or just really like really crappy classic rock, you might know this song as the one that begins with the line, starry, starry night. So there are a ton of other examples about how Van Gogh has been integrated into pop culture and our daily lives ever since then, but that really started hitting this height in the mid 20th century. <clears throat> so what is it that we talk about when we talk about Vincent Van Gogh? That is one of the big questions because it's really hard for us to escape this fact that we think of him as this really sad, totally horrible person, um, totally horrible situation for a person, not a horrible person. And the fact of the matter is that this was probably a tale that you grew up with, but not just that. Your parents probably grew up hearing this, your grandparents probably grew up hearing, hearing this, and also your great-grandparents, because only two years after Vincent van Gogh died, he died in 1890, only two years after his death, art critics and writers were already calling him a genius when they were writing about him and his works. But of course, it wasn't just that, they were calling him a forsaken genius and a mad genius. So really early on, these two phrases, forsaken genius, tortured genius, they became inseparable almost immediately. So for me, two questions really arise wide array. The first is, is the idea of Vincent Van Gogh as this mad tortured genius a reality? Can we quantify it? Or is it just a sexy term that we tell ourselves because it sounds cool? It sounds really exciting and almost sexy romantic to call somebody a tortured genius. And then, if we admit that that's true or we accept this is true, then how much of that genius is due to madness or mental illness? So where is that line between the two? So luckily, I think we can actually maybe try to put these in terms that are quantifiable. So first I wanna go through and talk about the four main things that I think we tell ourselves when we talk about Van Gogh that are things that we use to say that he was this poor suffering soul. And then I think we can go and either confirm or refute them. Then we can move on for there and we can make our decision. So the first thing that we see is probably the most minor. On the screen is a cartoon about painting selling for thousands of dollars after you're dying. So the thought is that Vincent Van Gogh never sold any works of art during his lifetime. We can actually refute this as false immediately. So as far as we know, he sold three paintings <laughs> during his lifetime. So that's not a lot, but also it sure as heck ain't zero, right? It's something. And so I went to the source to find more information about this, the best source that I could find, which is the Van Gogh, uh, yeah, excuse me, the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. They have a wonderful series called 125 Questions, where you can learn as little information or as a lot of information as you want about Van Gogh. And it's everything from why he loved the color yellow so much to learning possibly how and why he may have committed suicide. So if you're looking to really get into some Van Gogh stuff, I highly recommend it, 125 questions. And they actually talk about this particular question. Did he not sell any works of art? And that is when they were able to identify specific works out there that were official sales in art galleries and through art dealers. One being the image that you see on the screen now, which is called the Red Vineyard, and it is found today in the Pushkin Museum in Moscow. And uh, that is just taking in consideration actual official sales. But the fact is that Van Gogh, like a lot of artists did at the time, was really involved in this unofficial sale of artworks. So he would barter and trade his works of art with other artists and would also use them as a kind of currency because he didn't have a steady job. So he was really just using whatever he could to get things like food, art supplies, books, clothes. So a lot of people actually started owning Vincent van Gogh works of art. And then also there were other artists who were friends of his, who were fans of his, and they would share works as well. So van Gogh also had his own art collection of people who he was really excited to share and own artwork with. And I also want you to know that we usually say that he was an unappreciated person, but the fact of the matter is that he actually did um, show a little bit during his lifetime and in multiple big cities, not just Amsterdam, but also Paris and Brussels, and that some big name artists were considered vocal fans of his during his lifetime, like Claude Monet. So 
take that for what you will, and also keep in mind one more thing, which is that Van Gogh chose not to become an artist and follow that artistic path until the last nine years of his life. Before that, he was thinking about being a minister and was doing a number of other things. So when you choose to only start studying art at the last point in your life, you're gonna spend a lot of that time trying to become the best artist that you can, trying to perfect your technique, and really just work on creating work for yourself before you get it out there. So my thought is that if Van Gogh had lived past the age of 37, he probably would have started selling quite a lot of work, and then this wouldn't even have been an issue. Now, the next question. The ear. <laughs> yes. This happened, this actually happened. I think if there's one thing that you know about Vincent Van Gogh, if you know next to nothing, it's that he cut off his ear. The story that we traditionally tell about this is that he cut off his ear after a terrible fight with one of his good friends who was an artist named Paul Gauguin. I have to give you a little bit of backstory, which is that one of Vincent Van Gogh's greatest dreams was that he hoped to found an artist colony. And so he wanted artists to live together and work together and really just spend their lives talking about art and art theory and making and creating. And so while he was living in the south of France, he sent out invitations to a whole bunch of people. And the only person to respond to him was Paul Gauguin. So Gauguin indeed did come to the south of France and live and work with him for a while. But the thing about Gauguin and the thing about Van Gogh is that both of them were very strong personalities. And they ultimately really clashed. So in December of 1888, they had a big fight and apparently Gauguin left, and in this moment of despair and self-mutilation, he cut off all or part of his ear. No one has been able to confirm whether or not it was the whole thing or just a little bit. And the funny thing is that Van Gogh himself has no memory of it. He didn't actually know what had happened until he sort of came to and realized that he had this bloody hole in the side of his head. So we don't fully know. There are a lot of different theories out there, including one that just popped up in recent years where um, some researchers said that a letter had surfaced that Van Gogh apparently received on the day that he ended up cutting his ear. And that was one from his brother. His brother, Teo, was his best friend, his number one supporter, his artistic fan, and also was his monetary backer, his financial person. So Van Gogh had no money coming in as an artist. He was spending all of his time just working and creating and trying to become the best artist that he could. So he wasn't out there making any cash. So in order to stay afloat, he really relied on his brother to give him money. And his brother in this letter announced that he was getting married. I think for a lot of us, we would say like, oh, that's a cause for celebration. Yay, good job, brother. You found somebody. Let's do this. But I think for Vincent, he was thinking about the fact that all of a sudden his brother now had someone else that he needed to support financially. And also, they were probably gonna have kids, which they did. And so all of the money that he may have had available to support his artistic brother, all of a sudden may just be drying up. So for me, I think it was probably, if this letter was indeed received on the day that he did cut off his ear, I'm betting you it was probably a combination of the two. This fight with his good friend, Gauguin, and this letter where he felt like everything was coming to an end for him and he would have to get a real job and stop creating. So probably it was those two things. One other thing that somebody has mentioned in the past few years, a, a amateur historian, put a, a theory forward that maybe Van Gogh had been um, attacked with a rapier, a type of sword, by Gauguin, who was known to be a good fencer. However, I think I would say just take that one with a grain of salt. Probably not true. Because we do know that Van Gogh was mentally ill. This is my third thing that we need to talk about when we talk about Van Gogh, is we usually talk about him suffering in some way from some kind of mental illness. This is certainly confirmed. We can say this right away. And that is something that if anybody can agree on, they can agree that he was dealing with some sort of mental disability. But the thing that no one can agree on is exactly what that was. 
So over the past few years, they've actually done a whole bunch of different convocations and um, conferences trying to bring art historians and medical professionals and psychologists together to talk about maybe what Van Gogh was dealing with. And there have been all kinds of different things. They've said that maybe he was schizophrenic, he had syphilis, borderline personality, um, a type of epilepsy, and maybe he was bipolar. I think that one seems to be the one that everybody is gravitating to the most. But the thing is that we can really only go not on medical evidence because none really exists. We can really only go on what Van Gogh himself talked about in his letters, especially his letters to Teo, which is that he felt a pervasive sadness. He suffered from hallucinations. He had this sense of incoherent speech, loss of memory, and a lack of time. So he probably wasn't abducted by aliens, but you know, there seem to be all these different things that are coming together in play. And then on top of all of that, he may have also been having these moments of lead poisoning because he was known to lick his paintbrush in order to kind of sharpen it so that he could get the brush stroke just right, and thereby ingesting lead paint, which is probably not a good idea. And then to make things all more complicated, because it's always more complicated, he was a known imbiber in the most popular drink of the late 19th century, which was absinthe. And I think it's so weird and ironic that you can go to the ABC store today and buy absinthe, and it's like Van Gogh brand absinthe of him looking like crazy self-portrait on the front of it. I don't know if I like that very much. But the fact is that the stuff that you can buy today at the ABC store is way, way better for you than the stuff used to be in the 19th century, where you could have blackouts at best case scenario, and then if you drink too much, it could literally kill you. So all of these things were really coming together to make Vincent van Gogh feel crazy. And no one can know what the combination is. It could actually be many things that came together that caused him to feel really bad and to do some really terrible things to others and to himself. Which brings to the last thing that we talk about when we usually talk about Van Gogh as this poor, tortured genius. And that is his suicide. So I am really intrigued by this story that maybe it was a murder that brought him to his death, either a purposeful murder or an accidental one. And again, if you're interested in that story, check out the second episode of the Art Curious podcast. But without giving too much away, it's, it's also kind of hard for me to accept because if there is one thing that we know about Van Gogh, it's that he made very clear in his letters to friends and to his family that he felt this constant depression, a very serious sadness. And it wasn't just that, it was all kinds of things. He was very clear about never quite feeling good as an adult. And that can lead us to doing all kinds of crazy things, like taking our own lives. So bringing all of these four things together, the selling of the artwork, we can refute that one. The ear, that happened. Mental illness, yeah. I think we can say that was a thing. And the suicide, I think we can probably, if not 100% confidently say that he probably did kill himself. So that's three of the four things when we talk about Van Gogh that bring us this story about him as this poor tortured soul. So that's a lot, but this is where it gets really interesting for me because what does all this confirmed suffering have to do with his creative output and his so-called creative genius? This is where I get really excited. So Van Gogh was working as an artist for only the last nine years of his life. And in that time, he created over 2,000 works of art. That is a lot. And out of that, 900 of those pieces were paintings. So think about how much he was actually cranking out, how much work he was getting done. A lot. He was basically doing nothing but working and occasionally drinking absinthe. Um, but according to his own admissions, and also how we can date his paintings, the most iconic, most incredible, and certainly the most famous works that he created were all done in a one-year period, from May of 1889 until May of 1990. Where was he living during that time? He was living here. This is a mental asylum at Saint-Rémy-de-Provence in southern France. So after the ear incident, he voluntarily committed himself to a mental asylum because he was obviously feeling that he was dealing with something and he needed serious help. 
And while he was living there, he was really fluctuating between these two different states. One is that he was feeling totally mentally incapacitated and could really do nothing but just wait for these moments to pass. The other half of the time, he was feeling very lucid, comfortable, and fairly normal for whatever you would consider normal for Vincent Van Gogh to be. And so his doctors and caretakers basically said, you know what, let's just go with it. Let's act as normal as possible. And they gave him permission to go outside of the walls of the asylum to the surrounding countryside, as well as to the asylum itself and its gardens, and actually create works of art while he was living there. And it was only in those lucid moments that he was able to paint. When he wasn't feeling great, obviously, he didn't get out there and do that. And while he was there for that one year period, he made over 150 different works of art, canvases, paintings, and then did a lot of innumerable drawings on top of all of that. 150 paintings is one sixth of the number of paintings he created in his entire lifetime, just in the year that he was living in saint rémy de provence So is it a coincidence then that he was suffering from this mental illness at the same time that he was at his most prolific and most abundant in creating works of art? So is there a connection between genius and madness? That is the big question. And it turns out that a lot of people have been really interested in this question for the last couple of decades. And people have tried to do various studies trying to see if there's a biological or medical factor that might link creativity with mental disorders. And it turns out that there seems to be a lot of contradictory information out there. One thing that people are thinking is that psychologists generally agree that if there is a connection between creativity and artistic temperament and sort of mental disorders or disabilities, it's probably not in the way that you think. So one thing that people seem to agree on is that artistic temperament, so people who have um, this goal towards creativity, so writers, musicians, visual artists, actors, Creative types sometimes tend to suffer more severely from mental illness. And I read one study that said that artists in particular have a stronger uh, correlation with depression almost 10 times greater than the general public, which is a lot. I think that's pretty crazy. So that might actually be on the, the more expanded side of things. But it's probably not the fact that they are creative that makes them more prone to having a mental disability or a mental disorder or a condition. It's probably more that people who have this so-called artistic temperament tend to be more sensitive, more self-reflective, and also more ruminative. So they're thinking over and over and over, sometimes about negative things, which can lead immediately to an increased amount of anxiety and also is one of the hallmarks for the first parts of going into a very serious depression. So if there isn't actually a link between madness and genius or creativity, then what is? But before we move on to actually talking about that, I just want to say that it would be totally remiss of us if we didn't mention right off the bat that there are a ton of creative people and artistic people out there who suffer from nothing whatsoever. So again, genius, madness might not be a correlation. So then what does make a genius? It's pretty tough to say because I think it's one of those things that's really um, very individual, just like creativity is individual and hard to quantify. But for all significant creative leaps and these big innovations, it seems like there are three things that are always found in these moments. The first is talent. You have to be able to pull this off. You have to have an innate talent to make something creative happen like this. Second is technique. You've got to have the methods and the manners to pull it off. But the third one is hard, hard work. So I think probably a lot of you are familiar with this quote by Thomas Edison where he says, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. I love that quote and I think it's very indicative of this idea that the most important part about the creative and genius aspect is working, is really sweating and getting out there. What you don't see when you're seeing these kind of like Pinterest pinnable quotes is the second part of the, part of the quote where he says, a genius is just a talented person who has simply done all of their homework. So really just reiterating this point that the idea is only a small part, but getting to work is the most important part. 
Somebody whose work I really admire is a psychologist called Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, which is like the best name ever. Um, and if you know anything about the concept of flow, then you've heard about this artist, or this, excuse me, the psychologist's work. He's somebody who's really studied the creative process for about four decades. And he tells a story in one of his books about a conversation he had with a sculptor named Nina Halton. And she said, Whenever I tell anybody that I'm a sculptor, they all say, oh, that is so cool. Oh my gosh, how amazing, what a cool job. And she always stops and says, really? Why? Because for her, she was spending all of her time with power tools and with chisels and really physically sweating away trying to create a sculpture. And it was a lot of hard physical labor. But for a lot of us, we just don't want to hear the fact that there's a lot of hard work involved in the creative process. And that's most of the stuff. That's what we don't see. And we just think about the romantic idea of what it means to say, I'm an artist. I'm a writer. I'm a sculptor. But it's just not sexy. And the fact of the matter is that to really follow through on a creative moment or creative inspiration, you need that hard work and you need to trial and error, you need follow through and it takes discipline. And I think all of those things are really not the hallmarks of a mind that is scattered or in disarray or in any kind of emotional distress. And that was certainly the case with Vincent van Gogh. Because remember, even at that most prolific time in his life when he was at the asylum at Saint Remy, he was in between these two states of feeling lucid and feeling like he couldn't do anything and he was only working and creating art in that time when he was lucid. So Van Gogh did suffer from madness, but he created work in spite of the madness, not because of it. And if we go ahead and we use that term, so those three things, talent, technique, and hard work, to quantify if someone's a genius, I think we can pretty much say, yeah, Van Gogh he was a genius. He spent years of his life with an innate talent in really trying to perfect his techniques to bring about these amazing works of art. And then think about the fact that he didn't have a family other than his brother. He wasn't married, didn't have any children. He didn't have a job, a steady job. And of course, he didn't have a smartphone or Netflix or anything. So he could spend all of the time in the world working really, really hard to create the best work that he could. So we can confirm in that way that yes, he fits the mold of what a creative artistic genius is. So now that we've established that, with the hindsight of over 100 years, can we still say that indeed he was somebody who's really important and formative in the history of art? And I can say yeah, because he brought this effusive personality and psychological connection to these mundane scenes in ways that artists really hadn't been able to fully pull off before. Van Gogh was one of the first people to do it. And his style, I think, is the most important part, where it really influenced generations of artists, even today. People like Matisse, who were really excited about these bright colors and tones that Vincent van Gogh did. And the flatness and perspective that he brought to some of his things would later recall people like the uh, German Expressionists. And for me, I think one of the most important things is the impulsive, expressive, super lively, uh, spontaneous brushwork that he would use in his paintings would then be really important for people in the mid 20th century like Jackson Pollock. So yes, he was indeed I think, this creative genius who's had a really long shadow in the history of art, even up to today. But madness? Madness had nothing to do with it. But what did was his hard work and his tenacity and his will to keep going and keep perfecting that technique. So before I end today, I just want to leave you with one more question. And that is, so with the right combination and a lot of hard work, can we all be geniuses? And you know what? Hell if I know. <laughs> but I think that it's probably worth giving a shot. So get out there and go to work. Thank you.